Um, Mark.
Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. If you can, let us know where you're joining from in the chat. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Let's start this event. Thank you, everyone, for attending the COVID Behaviors Dashboard webinar. My name is Jenny Stolo, and I am here representing Gorn Research. I am very proud and very happy to be here and to be a part of the COVID Behaviors Dashboard initiative that we share with you today. The COVID Behaviors Dashboard uses data from the COVID-19 Trends and Impact Survey, or CTIS, C-T-I-S. The CTIS was launched by Facebook in 2021 in partnership with the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon University in the United States and the University of Maryland Social Data Science Center globally. The survey asked respondents a series of questions around mental and financial wellness. Before we start our program, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. First, please note that we have simultaneous French and Spanish translations occurring. I'm going to advance the slides to show our French speakers how to access the interpretation channel as an example. You'll see the name of my colleagues on the webinar today who can help with any technical issues. Second, please use the chat room to greet your colleagues, introduce yourself, and let us know the diverse range of countries represented today. Third, as the presentations occur, please use the Q&A tool at the bottom to submit your questions for the panelists. Some of the questions will be responded to directly in the Q&A tool. Others will be pushed to the panelists with an open discussion at the end. If we could move the slides. Those are the French slides for our French speakers. And the next slide, please. Great. And one more slide when you're ready. Great, thank you so much. So once again, my name is Dr. Stolo. I am here representing Gorn Research, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, specifically, the research pillar. I am the focal point of risk communication and community engagement for the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I turn it over to our wonderful panelists, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the content and purpose of today's presentation. Today, we are talking about a very serious and far-reaching topic, mental health and wellness during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout this webinar, you will hear about global data, country impacts, 
and community-based interventions. Data trends will be shared from over 100 countries globally. While the breadth and depth of today's data are substantial, we kindly remind the audience that mental health and wellness are very dependent upon sociocultural context. Furthermore, the data shown today are not diagnostic. These data aim to provide insights into causes, factors, impacts, and possible interventions for mental health and wellness during this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We have a lot to share with you today. We're very excited to get started. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our very first panelist, Dr. Dominic Shaddock. <clears throat> thanks, Jenny. Uh, and thanks to all the people who have tuned in this morning. Uh, we'll go over a few different things today and uh, provide both some research from the CETAS as well as some programmatic outcomes or programmatic uh, approaches to address these issues. Um, so if you don't mind going, let's jump right in and go to the next slide, please. So again, it's on behalf of the dashboard team and the folks who've been building the COVID behaviors dashboard over the last year. Uh, and even before that, with other work we had done through the uh, through Facebook and our, our, our relationship with Meta, uh, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of our team. Uh, so our, my presentation will describe how wellness or mental health is captured within the COVID trends and impact survey. Uh, and then I'll provide an overview of two documents uh, created to that include wellness data from the CTIS. Uh, the first is an editorial that focuses on men's health, and then we'll switch gears to general data across men and women. Uh, and that second uh, part of my presentation uh, is, is about a recent technical brief that presents data from the six WHO regions. All right, so let's jump right in. If you'll go to the next slide, please. The CTIS collects wellness data using a, a few different questions. The first two are pulled from the Kessler Psychological Distress uh, Scale, uh, and these questions focus on depressive symptoms and anxiety in the last seven days. Uh, this Likert scale uh, provided participants with five response options. Uh, there are also two additional questions that capture participants' reported worry about two everyday concerns, food and finances. Uh, for these questions, the participants chose from a different five-point Likert scale to assess their worry. Uh, it's important to note that the CTIS is rigorously translated into local languages uh, and piloted by expert partners from within each country. For the, uh, as Jenny mentioned a little bit earlier on, the CTIS uh, is most recent. The, the most recent version of this survey has been running since May. It's a joint collaboration between Meta, the University of Maryland, Carnegie Mellon University and Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Communication Programs. Although the survey has been running since the fall of 2020, the most recent version uh, since May of 2021 has had more than 34 million responses uh, in the past year. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. So with the onset of COVID came concern about the overall mental health of the world. Uh, from that outset, uh, global organizations were concerned that the COVID prevention methods uh, could result in decline in mental health for some individuals. Research began to paint a picture of factors related to uh, mental health and mental health decline. Uh, and, and yet in some, for some time, the overall picture of the world's mental health status uh, was somewhat up for debate. A few studies identified a spike in mental health issues uh, that may have declined to pre-pandemic proportions. Uh, but there's a variety of research that is out there that should be explored and, and I think most of it pushes the idea that COVID has had some negative uh, mental health outcomes. Uh, so over the last two and a half years, the topic of mental health has been front and center uh, in workplaces and in our homes. And today uh, we see particular articles consistently disseminating information about how to mitigate mental health challenges uh, and, and manage your overall wellness. And we also may see the impact of these COVID-related related stressors in our own lives and among our peers. Uh, so if you'll go to the next slide, please. A portion of my personal work outside of the dashboard uh, focuses on men's health. Uh, as co-chair of the USAID-supported Male Engagement Task Force, our responsibility is to raise awareness of gender-related health challenges. As co-leader of the COVID behavior, behaviors dashboard, I saw the opportunity to analyze these data and increase awareness about mental health challenges among men. Like women, men's mental health impacts their behaviors. 
as disproportionate holders of power in many relationships, identifying and managing men's mental health issues can be hugely impactful uh, for that individual, but also for those individuals surrounding him. Mental health issues have been found to contribute to financial challenges, substance abuse, and violence. Research has also shown that men are less likely to report mental health issues than women. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, using some descriptive statistics, we analyzed the mental health questions from the CTIS and found that 36.8% of men globally reported feelings of depression, 33.8% reported feelings of anxiety, 43.9% worried about food insecurity, and 67.5% of men reported uh, being worried about finances. For each indicator, prevalence was marked higher among younger men and steadily decreasing among successive older, older age groups. Uh, so for example, 44% of 18 to 24 year old men worldwide reported feelings of anxiety compared with 22.8% uh, among those men 55 years and older. Prevalence also varied substantially between countries, as you can see in the visualization here. What's important to note is that women's rates for depression and anxiety were similar and actually slightly higher. Um, and I'll summarize findings in the next couple of slides uh, at the end of this presentation. So switching gears to the next slide, please. Um, so this now I'll start talking about a little a technical brief that we recently posted on our website, uh, covidbehaviors.org. Uh, this brief highlights summary statistics as well uh, of the wellness variables within each of the six WHO regions. It's our hope that this document facilitates some of the initial planning or supports policy decisions about uh, deployment of mental health services. We realize that this is kind of a first step in very higher level statistics, hopefully, that can hopefully be dug into a little bit deeper uh, over time. Please note that a separate technical brief that focuses on 21 low and middle income countries is also available on our site. All of the data in the technical briefs and the slides that follow were collected in March of 2022. Uh, so let's dive into a couple of those tables. Next slide, please. Give you a moment to look as before I start talking. So just a quick reminder, these data reflect all participants and not only men. Uh, and this is a chart from the WHO Eastern Mediterranean region. And you can see each of the variables, nervousness or anxiety, depression, depressive feelings, uh, worried about finances, worried about food, and the response options that we captured to, uh, to, to include in those percentages. Uh, in this region, in the WHO Eastern Mediterranean region, reported the highest rates of nervousness anxiety, or anxiety uh, and depression among all six regions. More than 50% of the respondents in the Eastern Mediterranean region reported symptoms of anxiety and depression. Okay, we'll go to the next slide, please. And again, I'll give you a minute to kind of digest which countries we're talking about here in the Africa region. We have a lot of data from many different countries, but we don't, unfortunately, we don't have every African country. The sample sizes were not large enough to calculate uh, the descriptive statistics. Please note that the participants' financial worries uh, in this region are highlighted in progressively darker red. So we have kind of, we've color-coded or made a heat, a heat map of these uh, graphics themselves, and you can see higher percentages uh, transition from that green to um, uh, a darker and darker red as it get, the percentage gets higher. So as here, you can see the participants worry about food insecurity of the Africa region uh, was extremely high. It was actually highest among all the other regions. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So this is the last table I'm gonna present. And you can see here, we're in the region of the Americas. And um, you, know, you can download, I, I don't wanna go too far into these data here. I want people to go to the site and actually download this brief for themselves and have a chance to play around with it, look at it, ask any questions of us through our, through our various contact mechanisms or request the data for additional analyses. Uh, and you can see that in this, in the Amer region of the Americas, uh, nervousness is lower than many other regions, uh, yet depressive depression uh, symptoms reporting is still pretty high with a median of 43%. Um, if you go to the last slide, please. 
Whether mental health challenges are elevated or not, our awareness, our awareness of them as impediment uh, in our lives uh, is abundantly clear and has become more clear over the pandemic. Researchers have identified social and economic vulnerabilities uh, that are associated with poor mental health and the COVID pandemic is placing them front and center. It's time to begin uh, increasing awareness of mental health challenges, reducing stigma associated with seeking treatment and begin applying mental health services. I'm really excited to pass your attention to our next presenters who will both dig a bit deeper into these data and share information about our intervention approaches. So uh, please take it away, Jenny. Thank you so much, Dominic. Dominic is the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning for the Breakthrough Action Project at Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. He is a great mind to have on this panel as he also co-leads the CAP COVID survey and data utilization efforts in partnership with Facebook, MIT, the World Health Organization, and GORN. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, his work has informed global program implementation, policymakers, risk mitigation behaviors, trends related to vaccine acceptance, and as you see now, trends related to mental health and wellness. Thank you so much for your presentation. Really meaningful data. Just a friendly reminder to our audience, this is being recorded and we are happy to share the recording with you after the presentation. This is also going to be available up on YouTube. Keeping all of this excitement going, I'd like to present our next panelist. Our next panelist is Kira Reem. Dr. Reem is a postdoctoral research scientist in the Department of Epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. She is supported by the NIH Psychiatric Epidemiology Training Program, and she completed her PhD in mental health at Johns Hopkins in July 2021. She is broadly interested in youth mental health and access to mental health care. And since the start of the pandemic, she has also studied trends in mental health and substance use in the general population in the United States. Dr. Reem, over to you. We're excited to see your presentation. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Great. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm just going to start a quick timer so I keep on track. OK, great. Cool. Got that under control. Um, I am really excited to be telling you today about an article that I led during my time at Hopkins last year. Um, I've since moved on to Columbia, but this is work that I did at Hopkins. Um, and this article was recently published um, in the International Journal of Public Health, uh, which I'm really excited about. And the title of the article was The Association of Non-Pharmaceutical Interventions to Reduce the Spread of COVID-19 with Anxiety and Depressive Symptoms a multinational study of 43 countries. Um, so if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so we know from many studies across the pandemic that non-pharmaceutical interventions, which I'll refer to as NPIs throughout this presentation, are highly effective at preventing COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. And another name for NPIs is community mitigation strategies. And so these are basically any sorts of strategies or interventions that the government can implement that don't involve a pharmaceutical intervention. So that's what I'm speaking about here. Um, and some examples of these different policy-oriented NPIs could include things like stay-at-home orders, workplace closures, social venue closures, limitations on the number of people who can come to a gathering, um, et cetera. And so we know that these policies have been very effective at preventing the spread of COVID-19, uh, but at the same time, there have been concerns raised about possible collateral consequences for mental health as a result of um, isolation and just not feeling connected to the people around you that can occur when these types of really necessary interventions are in place. Um, can we go to the next bullet? Um, great. Uh, and so, so with, with the research study that I'm about to describe, we had two research questions. The first one was, to what extent are federally mandated NPIs associated with anxiety and depressive symptoms during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and thank you. Uh, the second research question was, basically, if we do see these associations, do they differ by gender and age? Um, and the reason we asked the second question was because you can imagine that some of these different NPIs might have different, co different consequences based on your sociodemographic characteristics. 
um, for example, older and younger adults, as well as men and women. And so we explored that in our analyses as well. Um, next slide. Um, perfect. Um, so with this study, we essentially joined two data sources, um, and I want to walk through each one of them and explain why they were such a great pair to use for this study. So the first data source was the Facebook COVID-19 symptom survey, um, which uh, Dr. Shaddock just talked about extensively um, and get, gave a great overview of. And we took these data, which were for individuals, and we linked this to country level data from the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. Um, can you go to the next? Perfect. Okay. So we've already talked about the Facebook symptom survey, but just a brief overview again. This, uh, this symptom survey is a daily repeated cross-sectional survey of active Facebook users ages 18 plus around the world. So a huge sampling frame of people who can respond to the survey. Um, and like we like we've described before, anxiety and depressive symptoms were measured with two items from the Kessler 10 scale, which measures mental distress. Um, and we also have noticed this, noted this prior, but I think it is really an important point to drive home. These are not clinical diagnoses. So we're measuring symptoms here, which is different from measuring a clinical diagnosis of anxiety or depression. Um, anxiety and depressive symptoms can have a wide, diff a wide scale of different severity and may not require um, clinical intervention. So that's what, that's what we're talking about here, um, not actual diagnoses. And so from this Facebook symptom survey, we included approximately 16 million people um, who were surveyed between April and December, 2020 and resided in one of 43 different OECD countries. Um, next, uh, perfect. Um, and so we took this symptom survey data and we linked it um, based on country and time to the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. Um, and basically what this, uh, what this source of data does, and I, um, it, it's a fantastic source of data and you can explore this online, it's publicly available. But basically what this source does is it compiles data for a series of indicators of country level government responses. And so they capture a number of different non-pharmaceutical interventions that I've listed here. And these were the ones that we, that we looked at in our study. So these include school closures, workplace closures, cancellation of public events, restrictions on the size of gatherings, stay at home requirements, restrictions on internal movement and international travel controls. So a wide range of different government responses. Um, next bullet point. Oh, perfect. I guess I removed that bullet point. <laughs> okay, cool. Now we'll talk about the methods and analysis. Um, so as I've said before, we took these two data sources and we linked them together. And so our first step with our, with our analysis plan was to assemble the linked data set. And so the individual responses from the Facebook survey were linked to country level non-pharmaceutical intervention data. And what we did to sort of establish a connection between the two um, sources of data was we actually lagged the non-pharmaceutical intervention data for one week prior to an individual survey date. So for example, if we had an individual who completed the survey on April 30th, their responses were linked to country level data from April 23rd. So Basically, we were looking at um, how something that happened the week before was impacting mental health the week after. Um, next bullet point. Um, and so in terms of, um, for the more statistical minded folks who are in the audience today, in terms of the models that we actually fit, we used logistic regression models for all of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and we fit them separately for anxiety and depressive symptoms. Um, next bullet point. Um, we also included a number of different covariates. Um, as you can imagine, mental health is affected by all the different things occurring in the social and environmental world or, uh, around us. And so we included other covariates that could presumably have affected both mental health as well as the types of interventions that a country is implementing. So we included COVID-19 cases, COVID-19 deaths, and we also included the survey month and the country to basically adjust for differences um, that are time fixed between different countries. Um, and the last bullet point, oh, okay, next slide. I guess I took that one out as well. <laughs> um, so moving into what I think is the more interesting part of this presentation now, um, the results. So on this first slide here, this is just a, just a descriptive overview of the, um, both the non-pharmaceutical interventions and anxiety and depressive symptoms over time. So in the top plot, what you have along the x-axis is time. So this is basically how many countries had a certain non-pharmaceutical intervention in place at a given time. 
So you can see that in May 2020, near the start of the pandemic, most countries had these types of interventions in place. And then over the summer, the, this, this proportion declined over time, but then increased again as um, presumably as cases increased again into the fall and winter. Um, and so you can see that proportion go back up. And it's actually quite striking if you look at the second plot below where we look at anxiety and depressive symptoms over time, they kind of follow a similar shape uh, as the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so I think that was a really interesting preliminary finding was just seeing how the pattern of mental health symptoms really mapped onto the, the, um, the non-pharmaceutical intervention uh, proportion as well. Um, next slide. So on this next slide, it's kind of a lot to unpack and I'll try to walk us through slowly and, and I'll, I'll be able to pick out some of the more important findings for you. So basically what this plot is showing here is different odds ratios um, for the association of these different non-pharmaceutical interventions with anxiety and depressive symptoms. And so it, um, the circles on the plot represent anxiety symptoms, whereas the uh, triangles represent depressive symptoms. And then uh, for we broke this, this plot is broken down by gender. So um, the coral colored points are for females, whereas the aqua colored points are for males. And then the last thing to note is with the dotted line in the middle, if, if a symbol is on the right side of that, or so if it's greater than one, this means that this non-pharmaceutical intervention was associated with higher anxiety and depression. Whereas if it's on the left side, it was associated with lower anxiety and depression. So I think as I get into the results, it might be easier to understand. Um, so if you could, uh, we, if we could move ahead, um, perfect. Okay, so the first result that I think was really fascinating that I wanna draw your attention to um, was differences between males and females in the association of school closures with mental health. Um, and it, it might seem intuitive. We essentially what this finding showed was that we saw stronger relationships between school closures um, and anxiety and depressive symptoms among women compared to men. Um, and this was kind of an intuitive finding and mapped onto a lot of what we, um, what I had read in the literature about the pandemic being a really gendered experience and how a lot of the different um, childcare burden fell onto women uh, when schools closed. So that was it, was, it was interesting to see how this played out in terms of people's mental health and the data. Um, let's move ahead again. Um, and then I guess, so there are some more interesting findings that are in the middle here that um, we unpack in our paper and you're more than welcome to read that. But the, the second finding I wanted to draw attention to was that for international travel controls, um, which again, kind of followed the gendered pattern that we would expect. These associations were stronger for men compared to women. Um, and what we hypothesized in our paper is that this might be related to the fact that men are typically expected to travel more for their, um, when they're employed. And so, there might be, um, it might, it might, it might have been more distressing for um, international travel to be limited for men compared to women. Um, so that was the second interesting finding. Um, can we go to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. Um, so this slide again is exactly, this figure is exactly like the last one, same interpretation, except instead of men and women, the, co the coral colored points are for uh, adults younger than age 25 and the aqua colored points are for adults older than uh, age 24. Um, sorry, that's a little confusing, <laughs> but basically older and younger adults. And so we saw less stark differences between older and younger adults than we saw between men and women, um, but there were some interesting ones. Um, if we can move ahead. One finding in particular that I thought was interesting was the, was the differences in first stay at home requirements. So stay at home requirements, um, again, were associated with higher anxiety and depression among uh, adults older than 25, um, which makes sense in that a lot of that was um, written about uh, in the literature during the pandemic. Um, but they were these stay at home requirements were actually protective for adults that were um, uh, younger than age 25, which we found really interesting and a little bit counterintuitive. Um, what we thought might have been going on here was that younger adults tend to be employed in positions that are more customer facing. And so with these stay at home requirements, this might have limited their exposure to the virus itself. And so this might have resulted in uh, less distress than we would have seen otherwise. So I thought that finding was interesting. Okay, uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, so just to conclude, I think what this study really illustrates is, um, is just the capacity that we can, uh, that we have for mental health surveillance in the population. And 
Indeed, calls have been made for this across the pandemic and generally for a larger capacity to support public mental health. Um, next bullet point. Um, and so what I think our results provide is interesting new information about how non-pharmaceutical interventions are associated with mental health. Next point. Um, I think that they can help governments respond to future outbreaks. And then for my last point, um, I think that these results also help identify vulnerable, vulnerable groups that may need targeted prevention strategies. Um, so that's kind of the take home message from our presentation. Um, and then going on to the last slide. Um, just some acknowledgements. I have the author list here for the, the excellent collaborators that I work with on this, on this publication. I also acknowledge our funding sources there. And then the QR code on the screen, if you're curious, will take you right to the publication, uh, which is open access. So it should be free and, and readily available for you to download and read if you're curious about reading it further. Um, thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you so much, Kira. That was absolutely incredible to see how data policy and just surviving the pandemic is all interconnected. Thank you so much. And just a friendly reminder to our audience, please feel free to use our Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. So you can list any questions you would like answered by our team, our panelists, live or direct. Great. Well, if we could have the next slide, I would love to introduce our final panelists of the day. This will be Stephanie Skavinsky, who is the Senior Research Associate at CETA Global. Um, Stephanie, sorry, computer glitch. Stephanie has dedicated her career to the practice, study, and scale-up of evidence-based mental health assessment and treatment, first in the US and then in low and middle income countries. Stephanie lived in Zambia for 10 years, where she worked with local partners and the Ministry of Health to scale up evidence-based interventions and systems of care for mental and behavioral health. During this time, she also trained, supervised, and implemented a range of evidence-based interventions in over 20 countries. She is a co-developer of the CETA approach, which we are very excited to hear about more today. Stephanie, over to you, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you, Dr. Shattuck and Dr. Reem for those wonderful presentations and really interesting findings. Uh, my name is Stephanie and I'm part of the Applied Mental Health Research Group at Johns Hopkins. And we've heard a lot of data and a lot of information on the burden of mental health problems that people are faced with and have been faced with throughout the pandemic. And we're gonna shift a little bit now to what do we do about that? You know, now that we know that these problems exist, that people are faced with all of these different ranges of symptoms and challenges, where do we go from here? So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit now about first just our team and our history give, to give you a little bit of background. And then we'll move forward to talk about our team's response to mental health and psychosocial health needs during the pandemic. Slide, please. So as Jenny mentioned, I've uh, worked in the field for quite a long time and lived in Zambia for 10 years, but also spent smaller periods of time in Cambodia and uh, DRC and a range of other countries and contexts. And part of my job, and one of the great privileges of my job, is that I get to train and work directly with supervisors and providers. And through that work, we really saw um, a range of different needs from populations. So when I would get on phone calls on a weekly basis or meet face to face with our supervisors, we would hear about the range of problems that people were, were faced with. And at that stage in our, in our team's work, we were really looking at implementing evidence-based mental health treatments, and they were focal treatments. So interpersonal therapy for depression, for example, in Uganda, or trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy for trauma in children in Zambia. And when we got on the phone, when I got on the phone with providers, they often said, you know, Stephanie, this is really great. We love that we're helping this child who has trauma, but the families we're seeing have more problems than that. They have other worries, grief and loss. They're affected by violence, by illness, HIV, the pandemic. And it's great that we can help part of the family, but we have nowhere to refer the rest of the family for, for mental health care. 
Um, and it left us all feeling pretty helpless. Slide, please. And unfortunately, comorbidity, you know, is the norm for mental health. As a clinician myself, when I was treating individuals, I rarely came across an individual who had just one problem. And yet, despite this comorbidity, the current approach for treating mental and behavioral health problems is a siloed approach. And as a team, we started to sit back and think, is this the best we can do? Slide, please. And what happens with a siloed approach is for a population to heal, a population that's faced with all of these different symptoms and problems, you'd have to train and scale up a range of different mental and behavioral health treatments, which is often not feasible and definitely costly. Slide, please. One solution to silo busting is uh, the common elements treatment approach, or we call it CETA. CETA is a modular and flexible treatment that can address multiple problems. So not just one or two problems, but a range of different problems across the lifespan. So trauma, depression, anxiety, violence, behavioral problems in children, parenting skills, relationship problems, and hopefully soon CBT for psychosis. CETA is also not just an intervention, it's really an approach to care. So using evidence-based assessments to understand what a person's needs are, what problems they're faced with, and then to triage and refer them to the appropriate level of care that they need at that time, as well as an ongoing monitoring system to make sure that what we're doing is working. Are we really helping a client with those symptoms and problems that they have? So all of our research on CETA has been done using lay providers as well. And we have evidence that it's effective in a range of different outcomes, which I'll go over soon. But let's take first a quicker look at, and a deeper look at what CETA is. Slide, please. So as you can see from this slide, you know, CETA is not a new intervention. It's built off of evidence-based components from cognitive behavioral therapy that have a wealth of data behind them. What is different about CETA is that these elements are then trained. So providers are trained in all of the different elements and skills. And then they're trained how to put these elements together based on an individual's problems and symptoms. So you could address one or two, you know, use one or two uh, elements to address mild problems or put together a range of different elements and if somebody had comorbidity or more moderate to severe symptoms. Slide, please. So what you see here is the uh, pretty common MHPSS triangle, so mental health and psychosocial triangle of services. And what we were hoping to achieve by developing CETA was an approach that would really span the triangle so that you would have one approach where providers could use one session for prevention. So let's say you have somebody or a group of people who have been faced by the pandemic are facing some challenges, but coping okay, but may need some additional coping skills in the moment. You could do a group session of just one element of CETA. You could put together multiple elements for three to five sessions for, for folks that are faced with a little bit more problems and symptoms. So somebody who has some you know, additional financial concerns, kids home, additional anxiety and depression, you could use several sessions. And you could then, if somebody had more severe significant symptoms, grief and loss, you know, major depression, trauma, suicidal thoughts, you could put together more sessions to, to create kind of a full CETA treatment with eight to 12 or more sessions. Slide, please. Just a quick you know, brief on CETA's evidence. So we've done over five randomized control trials. We have several still going now. And across those trials, we use lay providers. So providers with grade eight to 12 education, and those providers implemented CETA, and through these studies, we found pretty significant results across a range of variables. 
with large effect sizes for mental health symptoms and violence, as well as medium size effect sizes for dysfunction and alcohol use. And uh, so just to say that there's there's a pretty wide range and, and solid proof that, that CETA is pretty effective in, in impacting these different variables. Slide, please. So that's a little bit of a history of where, how we developed CETA, where it came from, what we're trying to do with it. And I think like most people, the pandemic hit, we were implementing CETA in over 10 countries and working with providers that we had trained. And all of a sudden we had to pivot. And so I wanna talk a little bit now about how we've adjusted and adapted our system of care to be able to address the needs of folks during the pandemic. Slide, please. Our major goal at this time was to really make sure that even though people were isolated and physically distancing from each other, that they still had access to quality mental health care. And the first step of that was to work with our providers to make sure they were okay. Uh, as many of you know, you know the mental, mental health providers as well as you know, medical providers, anybody working frontline in the community, they're from these communities too. And, and the pandemic didn't pick and choose who it was going to impact. And so making sure our providers' mental health and well-being uh, was okay before they can work with other people was really important to us. So the first step was really check-ins with staff and then making sure that we had accurate information and community educators and connectors that were based in the community and were able to provide this information through pamphlets, through videos, through social media, through loudspeakers sometimes in some of the refugee and IDP camps we work in, um, of what to look for. What are the signs of stress? When should somebody seek further help? What can people do on their own to if they're feeling distressed? And so those community educators ha also had telephones and access and linkages to CETA trained providers. The other way that we pivoted in this time was really to create a CETA telehealth manual so that all of our interventions were available over Zoom, phone, or any way people could connect during the pandemic. Slide, please. So just a, some pictures. This is from our, our work in Myanmar of some of the handouts that were sent out. So just looking at what stress during a pandemic can look like, what's normal. Um, and, and then we had pages on kind of what, what would be something we would consider, you know, where somebody would need to reach out for more help. Slide, please. And then things that you can do to take care of yourself, setting schedules, getting into a routine, making sure you exercise and other kind of self-care tips. Slide, please. The other way that we pivoted for CETA was really to be able to make sure that we can continue to build capacity of, of providers in this time, right? With growing mental health needs, we needed to make sure that there were enough providers to, again, increase access to care. And so what you'll see here is during the pandemic, we have a full technology training. We've developed a technology app where all of our didactics are on a tablet. And so we can run the didactic piece over the tablet and then do role plays and behavioral rehearsal in small groups over Zoom. We also have a hybrid option. So you'll see this other participant who has the mask on with the tablet. So they were in a group setting, uh, but socially distancing and, and doing a technology slash live training. And then we have the live training option. So those were just some of the ways that we've pivoted during this time to be able to continue to provide access to quality evidence-based mental health care. Slide, please. This is just a picture of the characters from the didactics, so our animated characters for the training. Slide, please. And then in the, in the tablets, we also have model videos as well as the instructions for the role plays that people do afterwards. Slide, please. Slide, please. And so just a quick note, just to wrap up on training process, we do training to competency, which really just varies depending on the type of provider that we're training. This, the least important piece, or I wouldn't say least important, but the shortest piece is the live training itself. What we know from the research and literature is that 
really people learn these skills as they're implementing on the job, which is why we use an apprenticeship model of training. Slide, please. And finally, just to say that, you know, I know I've mentioned this before, but our, our focus is really on providing um, access and capacity building to lay providers up to professionals. So, you know, you can have a grade eight or 12 education. The biggest and most important thing we've seen over time is that providers need to have time to do this, that that's one of the most impactful, uh, one of the most important things to have an impact over time and to sustain a treatment. So I'll end there. Uh, just to say thank you again so much for joining, for having us. And if you have questions or want more information, you can find it on our website at uh, CETA Global, which I'll put in the chat as well. Back to you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. That was great. It's always great to see solutions, right? Not just data, not just problems. So really great positive note to wrap up our three panelists. Now I'd like to invite all of our panelists back to our main screen. I will go through the Q&A section. First up, I would love to follow up on what Stephanie just presented on. Um, sorry to piggyback Stephanie, I'm sure you're grabbing a sip of water, but we have a great question. The, how, can you talk about how much of local dialect, folklore techniques, cultural tailoring you use in your approaches, specifically in Myanmar? Absolutely. So we work, you know, we see the, what we do, kind of some of the goals of treatment remain the same, but every context we work in, there's an adaptation process. And we work directly with our supervisors as we train this to adapt, to make sure we're including all of those different, uh, you know, cultural components that are really important to the community. And so for every uh, location that we worked, we have an edited manual that really includes key examples, techniques, um, as well as language translations, right, to, to the area. So in Myanmar, for example, we have a manual in Kachin, in Burmese, and Karen. And, and our local supervisors really help to build that and are key in the adaptation process. Great, thank you so much. We love to see evidence-based as well as community engaged, really great. Um, the next question I'd like to direct to Dominic. You presented a lot of large data, regional data, global data, trends. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how sociocultural context played a role in your findings. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I can't give specific uh, examples from the literature, but, uh, you know, we can assume that there may be higher awareness of uh, psychological dynamics or topics such as depression and anxiety in some contexts as opposed to others, uh, with the idea that people tend to just kind of move on and get along with their life as uh, without maybe taking those things into consideration in the same definitional way that we do uh, in, in many Northern countries uh, or developed uh, countries. So I feel like it, it is something that, you know, we do need to kind of pay close attention to and, and maybe our other experts on this, uh, on this panel have experience with translation and um, how those questions are actually interpreted by some of the participants um, and, and, and some of the dynamics, especially the work that Stephanie's done, you know, awareness of, of mental health challenges in some contexts is very low. Uh, in a, in, in I, I tend to focus more on the dynamics between uh, gender and how men oftentimes, they may be aware of it, but it may manifest itself in certain ways and in their inability to have conversations about mental health topics or their inability to kind of, you know, acknowledge it as a mental health issue when it, uh, you know, viewing it as something other than uh, in, their, in their own uh, lives. Um, but yeah, maybe some of the other uh, experts on this as well have, have insights on that. It's a good question. I open it up to the other panelists if you'd like to jump in. All right, data speaks for itself. I'll just take away from that. Another friendly reminder that data and trends are great to have and great to inform. But until there's that sociocultural grounding, community engagement, and knowledge of what the data means on the ground, 
solutions, policies, interventions can't really be built. So thank you for that, Dominic. Great answer. Moving on to the next question. Uh, Kira, moving on to your presentation, actually, and thinking about policy, or in thinking about, you talked a lot about COVID-19 interventions and findings from that. How would you translate your findings into future policies for COVID-19? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that there's kind of two ways of thinking about it. I think um, like the first way is policies and interventions that are directly related to mental health. And then I think the second way of thinking about it is policies that um, are more related to social and economic conditions, but could have downstream implications for mental health um, as a result of improving other aspects of people's lives. Um, so in terms of, I can just throw out some policy examples. Um, like you just said, obviously these need, these need to be culturally contextualized in order to be effective. Um, but if I can just throw out some examples, um, in terms of policies or interventions that are more at the population level that are directly related to mental health, um, one thing I saw a lot discussed in the literature during the pandemic was things like um, uh, like telephone hotlines, for example, both for the general population, but also for specifically for individuals who are at high risk of loneliness, um, like older adults during the pandemic. So that's like one example of, a, of an intervention that's um, really specifically directed at mental health. Um, moving on to other types of interventions or policies. Um, these could include things like unemployment benefits, sick pay, um, basically anything that really addresses people's economic status and can improve that for them. Um, I think I think connecting that to an individual's mental health, uh, like using data, it can be really difficult. Um, but just like thinking about possible downstream impl implications, um, like there's a very good reason to expect that those types of interventions and policies would eventually lead to better mental health for people. Um, so yeah, those are kinds of the policies that I'm thinking about. Um, and again, uh, we wrote more about this in our paper um, if people are interested in reading further and, and getting more specifics. Great, thank you so much, Kara. Panelists, yeah. do you have any thoughts on how your findings could relate to policy before we move on to the next question? I will just add that I think one of the one of the things that we really work towards is just integration and development of mental health care policies at ministries of health in all of the countries we work in and a lot of places that we work, you know, I think the pandemic has brought about some desire to really ramp up the pol existing policies for populations that are in need and so I would just say that you know care and treatment integration into Ministry of, of health is really important. I would also say like we're finding even in some of the um, we receive at the Breakthrough Action Project that uh, Center for Communication Programs, we receive a lot of USAID funding and we're seeing mental health start to kind of bleed into other topics such as uh, postpartum, uh, postpartum family planning use uh, and, and, and building out programs. We're actually running a trial on a program in, in Ethiopia around postpartum depression uh, and, and assessing that. and using some of the tools from the CETA program actually to uh, uh, kind of build a structure and a platform from which to community health workers can can identify women and push them into like collectives and groups where where uh, they can talk through some of the challenges they're, ma they're managing at that time. Um, and so we are seeing this bleed in, over into other topic areas as well. Great, and I, I wanna piggyback on something that Stephanie quickly mentioned, but uh, our Audience members are curious about whether the CETA training has been used with government employed community level workers, community health workers, or if it's mainly volunteers. Both. Uh, so in Zambia, we've actually scaled it up. So we have a countrywide program where we're working with the Ministry of Health to integrate CETA into HIV care and clinics. So we have over 20 clinics that have providers trained throughout the provinces in Zambia. And we're working on the same in Namibia and South Africa, as well as Uganda. And so, yeah, our goal is absolutely to try to think through the most sustainable methods uh, and integration into, into countries' uh, existing health programs. So yes, we've done both and, and have been successful. Great question, thanks. Great, and this will go to all three of you. It's a two-part question. 
So the first part is, what are your lessons learned in the research component of this? If you were to do the study again or to present data similarly, what would you do? And then just lessons learned for in an ongoing pandemic. And these are not problems that are going away, unfortunately, anytime soon. So what are your lessons learned from a research perspective, but also from a programmatic perspective? And I, I see, Kara, you've unmuted, so I'll let you jump in first. Sure, thank you. Um, I think I can speak more to the research perspective than the programmatic one. Um, but I think, I think one of the greatest um, things that was exciting about using the CTIS data and one of the greatest pleasures of using it was how granular it was. I think it was really essential to have that data that was coming in every single day and we could map people's responses to very specific points in time. Um, and uh, just for people on the call who aren't um, closely involved with research, like that type of, that level of detail is pretty rare in survey research. You can't always, you don't always have enough people responding on each day um to really like map people's responses on a temporal level to like a given day so that was really exciting for me because we were studying mental health in the context of a rapidly unfolding crisis where it was unclear what was going to be happening the next day and so being able to map mental health so closely to those changing events that happened day by day was was really exciting and so i think that was that was one of the key strengths i encountered with the ctis data Great, I'll turn it over, Dominic. Yeah, so I, like similar to what Kira is mentioning is that, you know, this is this is an opportunity to kind of see where countries are in this on this topic area. And, and you don't have that. And I, I don't know of any other surveys that have actually provided this level of detail. It'd be great if there were more questions, of course, but definitely, you know, kind of setting a, a, a foundation for this work in the future. What we also found is through the Mail Engagement Task Force, we held a webinar back in uh, the spring of 2021. Uh, and that was a webinar that focused on men's mental health and mental health issues. We invited different programmatic uh, interventions that had happened, like Linnea Kalma uh, from, um, from, forgive me if I'm mistaken, but I think it was Columbia, that uh, they actually had started a hotline for men and some of the challenges that men were facing uh, in, that, in, their, in Bogota and some other communities. Um, we heard from a man who runs uh, the Men, 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 the podcast in Tanzania, which is a podcast in Tanzania specifically focused on men's mental health uh, and kind of talking through and destigmatizing mental health. So it's exciting that we're in this moment because what we have is an opportunity to kind of capitalize on programs like CETA, you know, the work that Kira is doing, you know, psychological work that's been doing, been happening in schools and education settings. And I feel like it's a, it's a it's a kind of a great opportunity to kind of see this evolve, and we're seeing this evolve quickly because of the pandemic. Um, hopefully, funding will follow that as well. But I think it's definitely a, a an opportunity to kind of reflect on this uh, this moment to say like awareness is raised, maybe stigma it's destigmatized to some extent. Um, but uh, you know, it's 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 a very interesting moment to kind of watch something evolve quickly. Uh, and, and to kind of keep track of it. And I think it's gonna be important for programming uh, across the board, uh, or I should say globally, uh, as we move forward. I know ministries of health are starting to talk more and more about this uh, in their work. And unfortunately, in many of the countries where I work, the, the, the low and middle income countries, they don't have an infrastructure of mental health services, right? So like not in the ministry of health, uh, oftentimes, I don't, I don't mean to generalize every country, but um, oftentimes there isn't, uh, that kind of foundation to build on. There's not a, a set of practitioners uh, who are providing one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling that they can call on for advice and guidance when that, that culture, uh, those people are few and far between, unfortunately. And hopefully this is a moment which their education system starts to develop and create uh, that professional cadre of, of healthcare providers. So I think hopefully that that's one of the results of this work, but it has been very interesting and exciting to watch. Thanks, Thanks for that, Dominic. That definitely the domino effect of what all of these findings could mean for future findings. Stephanie, would you like to jump in with any last thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add, I think from our research findings that there's hope, right? That this is, you know, we have a growing need um, and we're starting to, to see an increased attention to mental health needs and, and mental health care. Uh, and, and there are interventions, there are systems, and, and we see that you can train lay providers 
and increase access in these communities and that ministries of health that we've worked with, you know, are able to uptake and create policies. And so I think that we're, we're at a very exciting time and, and very hopeful time to start to get more access out there for, for those that need it. What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you. It is very fitting that we end on a note of hope when talking about mental health and wellness. Fantastic. Um, to stay on time, we will end our program here. I just want to thank our wonderful panelists, the staff running the show behind the scenes, and all of you in the audience for your active participation and fantastic questions. The recording will be made available to you after it's done being processed. Please check out all of the reports, resources, websites, etc. that were mentioned today, and we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure.